A few of your Bibles with this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we'll begin there at verse 19 in just a moment. Uh, Darla and I, uh, over the years and even more in these last few months, a um, lot of uncertainties in the world, and there's things coming up, and, and the elections might drastically change our nation, and just, you know, praying about those things over the years like you have been, and uh, more so as, as this time has come. And um, there, are, I was talking Wednesday night, What's, what's happening in Israel is much more telling even more than so than what's happening in America. And, and if there's ever, um, you know, to line up with what's going to happen in the last days, we watch what happens with Israel. And there's a lot of things just going on, and if you've just been watching the news lately. And so I, uh, Darla and I were talking about, like, what, what are things that the Lord would want to speak to us to make preparations for whatever needs to happen and those kind of things? And I remember when I was just a very young person, I remember there being some uh, message in tongues and, prof and uh, interpretations and then prophecies about getting your financial house in order during the, the recession of the 70s. And I, and I remember a lot of people just really heeding what the Lord said, and then the difficult times came, and they were already prepared, prepared for that ahead of time. Well, that's kind of what Darla and I were just talking about. And always in that conversation this is the, the dilemma that we often face because is preparations for the future is that just more of our worrying or is that making doing diligence of what could happen in the future and we always struggle with that and there's always scripture that talks about hoarding and you know building bigger barns and all those kinds of things and that's definitely not the will of God for a Christian but what is the difference then? When, when does it become uh, anxiety over the future or preparation for the future? So let's read through this first verse 19 of chapter 6. It says, Do not store, your, store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin destroy. Do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There are two words in Scripture, and there are opposing words. One of them is foresight, and the other one is foreboding. Foresight is looking into the future and then preparing for it. Foreboding is looking into the future with anxious thoughts and worrying about what might happen in the future. 
So as Christians, Jesus says here that we are not to worry about our lives. The King James Version says to take thought about our lives. So foresight is always a good thing. It enables us to prepare for life's inevitable troubles. Foresight keeps you working at your job because you know that the bills will come. They will keep coming. And so the Bible condones planning ahead. Here are a number of scriptures that talk about that. Proverbs 20, verse 4, a sluggard does not plow in season, so at harvest time he looks but finds nothing. Proverbs 20, 18, make plans by seeking advice. If you wage war, obtain guidance. Proverbs 14, 15, a simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. Proverbs 6, 6 and 7 says, Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. And then Proverbs 31, 15, She gets up while it is still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. And then Proverbs 31, 21, When it snows, she has no fear for her household. For all of them are clothed in scarlet. And so the Lord tells us over and over again in the scripture to plan and give careful thought to the future. What he doesn't want us to do is to have anxious thoughts about the future. And so this passage here in Matthew chapter 6, there are three parts to the message that Jesus brings. He says, first of all, worry is contrary to all of the lessons of nature which absolutely show that it is totally unnecessary. Excuse me. Secondly, worry goes contrary to the revelation of who God is. He says here, the wicked worry. And so obviously there's a contrast drawn there. We're not to worry. We're supposed to be on the opposite side of worry. And then thirdly, worry runs contrary to the very providence of, of God. So the first one, worry is contrary to all the lessons of nature. So think about this for a moment. We trust God for absolutely everything in our life. Every moment that we live on this earth, as we sang this morning, is a gift from God. You woke up this morning. You're on the sunny side of the grass this morning. Praise God. It's a gift from Him. And so the very structure of our bodies and how we look are all dependent on God. We did not decide how our body or our looks would be. We were dependent on God. He created us. And so if I have to trust in God for the very air that I breathe, then why don't I trust him for lesser things, like what I will eat or what I will wear? Life comes from God himself. He's the giver of life. And so I am totally dependent on God on whether I live or I die. We are here today because God said to live today. And so why shouldn't I trust him in the little things of what I eat or what I will wear? He has given us the gift of God, of, of life. And when he gives a gift, he provides everything that is necessary to sustain it. <coughs> Think about this for a moment. Well, whenever God gives you children, is that the thought that, you know, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you these children, and if you do what I say to do, and you, you're diligent, and you work, and all those kinds of things, I will provide for those children. And oftentimes, you know, we're up, we're up at night and thinking, oh, I'm going to be able to pay for this, I'm going to pay for that. God said, no, I'll, I'll provide for that. If I give you the gift of children, I know how to provide for that. I can provide work for you. I can, I can take care of those things. We, in our own children, we were never very well off, but they never went without clothes or food or any of those kinds of things. And, and I don't even know if they knew we weren't well off. They, just, they kind of just were enjoying life as they grew up. God was good enough to give us our children. We were trusting him that he would provide for them. So he provides in so many different ways. And verse 26 says, the very lower forms of creation 
have been abundantly taken care of by our Heavenly Father. Now think of where you are in the, in the levels of creation. All of, the, all of the life forms of creation do not live forever. You do. You will live forever somewhere. Whenever God created you, he created an eternal being. You will live forever. You are the highest form of his creation. And so he says there, if I take care of the sparrow and I take care of the flowers and how I dress the flowers is so far beyond even what Solomon was adorned with, how much more will I take care of you? You are my highest form of creation. I died for human beings. I didn't die for flowers. I died for you. And so he says, this is, you are the highest form of all that God created. I take care of the lesser things. I will definitely take care of you. God is not cheap. <laughs> he takes pleasure in abundantly blessing his servants. I, I could tell story after story of God's provision in such miraculous ways. Um, today, Darlin and I have been married 45 years. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Gary and Deneen are married today 34 years. Um, just, we, re, we heard from uh, Donna and Ed on Wednesday night, 51 years this week. Incredible, isn't it just that, that couples stay together? It's a, it's a testimony to the goodness of God. Uh, they, Donna and Ed said Wednesday night, they attribute that to seeking first the kingdom of God, their longevity in marriage. But in, in the provision of all that God gives to us, he has abundantly provided for all of our needs. And so these forms of creation that are inferior to humanity, how much more will your heavenly Father take care of you? Birds don't sow or reap or store away and get more and more in the barns, yet the Lord takes care of them. I have often thought about how um, we think as human beings, and some of it is pure arrogance. And I, I thought about all the debate that's going on right now. Not that we shouldn't take care of the earth. The Lord put the earth in our care. You all see that all the way back to Adam. But there's a thought that often goes around that we are, are you know, like the supreme being. There is no God, so we're the supreme being. And that we can destroy this planet if we want to. And so our, our whole reason in life should be to save the planet. And in that sense, it's like, you know, that's like the biggest job that you could possibly have. That's like we're superheroes. We're, we're going to save this planet. It's bigger than saving the whales or saving trees or anything. We're going to save the whole planet. But it really is one of the highest forms of arrogance. It's the thought that in some way, God doesn't exist, and so we are masters of our own destiny, and we, we determine everything. There, in no way is it possible to destroy this earth until God's done with it. No way. Man is puny in the sight of God. So there's no way that we can destroy this earth until God says, okay, I'm done with that. I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Until then, I've got purposes for this planet. You're not going to destroy it. You're not going to, that's just absolutely is not going to happen. And so God has blessed us with intelligence to work and then to reap the benefits from our work. God wants us to work. He says if we don't, we shouldn't need. He gives us the ability to work so that I do not starve. I can influence my future by working. What I cannot influence by working, I trust God to take care of. Now, it's working hand in hand. We cooperate with God. He doesn't say to us, you know, all right, you know, just sit down there, cross your arms, don't do anything, and then I'll provide for every single need. He doesn't say that. He, he wants us to cooperate in working with him. So I do that. You work, you take care of what you know to take care of, and then what I cannot influence, 
I do not worry about that. I, it's, it's out of my hands. It's only, only God can take care of that. And so the, the forms of creation that are inferior to us, then they are an example to us to say, you know what, they do what they can do. They gather food when they can. They do all of those things. And yet they're trusting, whether they know it or not, they're trusting a creator to take care of them. They do, that's all they can do. They're not, you know, they're not running around worrying. You don't see animals worrying about how they're going to do things. They're trusting whoever created them. That's the way it is. We trust. And so the lower forms of creation are inferior to us in another way. God is their creator, and he created them in beauty and in, in, in all of the splendor that he created him. But the difference is, is that God is our father, more than just our creator. He will not forget his child, the scripture says. The Bible says, can a mother forget a child that nurses at her breast? There are times that human beings, human mothers, can forget the children that they have. But God says he will never, ever forget us. In fact, he says that our names are engraved on the palms of his hand. He's not going to forget us. He's not going to let you go somewhere. He's taking care of you every single step. He never forgets you. He never forsakes you. Secondly, worry goes contrary to the revelation of who God is. Worry for the future is at the very heart of being worldly-minded. And so the sinful nature in each one of us leads us to put too much stock in creature comforts, in material things that are here on this earth. And so the worldly-minded rich man, he shows his love for material goods by storing up his treasure on earth. But listen to this. The worldly-minded poor man shows his love for material things by worrying, by anxious thoughts. And so both of them have at the core, at the same, the same root, they are both wanting to serve money. And Jesus says here, you can't serve God and serve money at the same time. We can so very easily put such extreme value on earthly things. Because we think that this life is everything. We, we often lose sight of the eternal life, and so we think, this is everything. I've got a plan for, you know, being here forever kind of a thing. We're not here forever. And so we can, we can value this life and the things of this life far too highly than he wants us to. I, I have thought all my life, ever since I've been raised in the church, we have sang courses that Jesus is all we need. And then at the same time, we get depressed when we can't afford to buy something that we want. And it's almost a contradiction. We're, we're saying, no, Jesus, you're everything that we need, but I need this too. I, I need this new TV. I need this new car. I need this. I need that. But you're everything. You're everything that I need, but I got all this other stuff I need too. Either he is everything we need or we're not telling the truth. And so Jesus says the pagans, those that don't even believe in God, they run after all these things. Our Heavenly Father, though, in contrast to that, He knows that we have need of all of those things. And He says there, then get the cart <laughs> where it needs to be, behind the horse. Get it in the right place. He says to seek first the kingdom of God. So how do I get rid of my worrying and my anxious thoughts? The secret to that is to seek Him first. I, priority is not the things. The priority is Jesus first. I seek his kingdom first, and then he says, if I do that, my heart's there, then the other things, I'm going to take care of those. They'll automatically be taken care of. We cannot say that we ought to trust God, and then at the same time say, no, my trust is in, is in my government check, or it's in all of the things that I've surrounded myself with. It is either him first, and everything else is behind that, or we're putting those things first. We're valuing them much higher. Our hearts have to be filled with one supreme desire. He must be our absolute everything. Years ago, when I was, when I was really young, 
Um, I remember there was a song that we were singing in those days, and it was called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And the last line of that chorus said, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things of earth will grow strangely dim when my eyes are focused and set on the Lord Jesus Christ. When he is first, everything else pales in comparison, doesn't it? It's not as important. He's the absolute priority. And then thirdly, worry runs contrary to the very providence of God in our lives. He says here that tomorrow always has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> I, I have, you know, like, it, I have thought about weeks that, you know, I would, I'd be praying, like, Lord, like, just have, please just have everything go smooth this week. Um, and, and rarely does that ever happen. I mean, there's always, you know, there's always some more peaceful days than other days. But generally speaking, there are challenges in every single day. I mean, there's things that come up that you don't expect. There, there are things that happen in, on, on a moment's notice. There, there are, I mean, and it's just in everyday life. It's just the way things are. It's the DNA of the world that we live in. There is trouble every single day. And, and the Lord even doesn't want us to be disillusioned by that. He says that ahead of time. In this life, you will have trouble. It's going to be, it's part of what happens here. So there's not in any way that we can some, somehow say, you know what, Lord, I, I would like to have a trouble-free life until I meet you in heaven. And yet somehow in the way that we think, we think, that well, that should be a part of me being a Christian. I should have a trouble-free life all the way till heaven. It doesn't work that way. And Jesus never said that it would. There are things that happen all along our journey here in life. There are challenges that have to be met every single day. And so you might work and you might plan to try to eliminate every problem and every obstacle that would ever come your way, but something that will come your way that you have not prepared for. It's just the nature of the DNA that we live here in this world. And so you can worry all you want, and there's still going to be more to worry about tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday. It'll, it'll just keep coming. You'll, I mean, you'll, you can have enough to worry about for the rest of your life, every single day. Or you can look at life in a whole different way. And that you can say, you know what, Lord, each and every day, <laughs> this it's a beautiful life that you give me. This new day is filled with all kinds of possibilities, all kinds of potential. Yes, there's going to be challenges. Yes, there's going to be difficulties. But you're there ahead of us. You've prepared the way. You've gone before us. None of us knows what tomorrow holds, but all of us know who holds tomorrow. And so we trust in him. I have thought back, you know, as, as we were, you know, we're doing our anniversary uh, 45 years, I was thought back about so many days that drastically uh, changed my life. Um, the top day of all was when I surrendered my heart to the Lord, changed everything about my life. I, I thought about the day that um, I was traveling with a music team, and one of the girls um, that was with the music team was uh, at school uh, in college with Darla. And so, um, you know, boys aren't supposed to be in the girls' dorm. So this girl says, uh, maybe I can sneak you up past um, some of the RAs, and I can get and I can show you the dorm. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. I would love that. So snuck into the girls' dorm, checked everything out, checked the bottom floor out, went to the upstairs floor. And when I went up to the upstairs floor, Darla poked her head kind of out of one of the rooms. And, and then her friend says, hey, Darla, this is Tim. And right away I was like, wow, I'm going to take that girl out if she's not busy kind of a thing. So we were away on that weekend, and when I came back on Monday, right after I got off work, I'm like, I'm going over to that dorm. And I knocked on the, on the door, is Darla there? You know, kind of. Um, that day changed everything, everything. I mean, just from that day on, it, 
it's been an adventure, to say the least. <laughs> it's been <laughs> good times and bad times, but man, has it been an adventure. It's been great. And then the days that my children were born. I remember each one of them. I was with Darla when she was giving birth. I remember each one of our children being born. Incredible days. Days that changed our lives entirely. And so there, those were good days that absolutely changed my life. There were also some days of trouble that totally changed our lives. The thing is, though, that worrying about the future would not have changed any bit of that. It would have not changed the good days. It might have ruined some more good days. It would have definitely not have changed the bad days of all of those years. Worrying about it wouldn't have done anything for it. In fact, science proves that worrying about it probably shortens your days. The stress that is added to that, worrying about the future will not change any of the future. And so worrying about the future does not empty tomorrow of its cares and its problems. All it really does is empty today of its strength. Because you're, you're so consumed with those anxious thoughts and the worrying that you really can't even get done what the, what the job of getting today done is all about. You're, you're, you're caught up and your mind's only half there because you're worrying about what tomorrow or the next day is going to bring. And so the Bible says that the Lord has given us strength sufficient to meet the challenges of today, not tomorrow. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't give us grace enough sufficient for tomorrow until it gets here. He doesn't give it out in, in the sense of, well, I'll just load you up for a good month and then you're good. Every day he gives strength for that day, for whatever challenges you're facing today, He's given you strength for that. Tomorrow is a whole new bunch of challenges, and he will give strength to meet the challenges of tomorrow when it comes. I simply have to trust him. He will take care of us every single day. He watches out for us. He knows the needs that we have need of. He will take care of you. Worship team, if you get ready to come. Whenever Israel was delivered from Egypt, of course, they're, they're in a very uh, bad predicament, so to speak. As far as, as what humans do, it's one of the circumstances that we hate to be in because we like to know that we can take care of ourselves. But the Lord leads them out into a desert and where they really can't take care of themselves and they're moving. He keeps them moving the whole time. Two and a half million of them out in the desert, and they're, and they're moving. They don't have anywhere to plant crops. They don't have anywhere to raise livestock, any of those kinds of things. They left just simply with, with the clothes they had, a few things, and they were out of there. And the Lord has them in such a predicament. And so they're, they're three days out, and, and they start what humans do. They start complaining and What's, I mean, we're going to die out here. Why did the Lord lead us out here in the first place? There's no way for us to eat. There's nothing here for us to get water with. We're just going to simply die. And the, and the Lord provides for them a, a heavenly bread called manna. And the amazing thing about it is that human nature being what it is, we're thinking, you know what? Um, I'm not really sure if God's going to provide tomorrow, so I better get a whole bunch of I better gather a whole bunch and, and save it because maybe tomorrow God's going to cut that off. And what happens? They wake up the next morning, and the manna that they saved from yesterday, it's all rotten. It's no good. And they begin to realize, you know what? Wow, we, we can only gather for what we're going to eat today. That's all there is. Now, the only day that he made an exception for that was on the Sabbath. The day before the Sabbath, you could collect enough so that you didn't have to go out and gather it on the Sabbath. But other than that, every single day you had to gather just what you needed for that day. You know, that's such a hard lesson for us to learn as human beings because 
When, when we're praying and when we're wanting God to provide, we're saying, God, like, provide for the next six months, would you? I don't want to have to every single day wonder where something's coming from. But that's what he wants. He wants to give us strength for this day, and I'm not going to worry about that. Whatever tomorrow holds, that's a whole new different ball game. Tomorrow, God will give you strength for tomorrow. All you've got to be concerned with is what's happening today, and he's going to give you the strength of whatever you need to meet the challenges of today. He's going to give that to you in order for you to meet those. The grace will be sufficient. And I don't have to stay up tonight worrying about tomorrow, like, Lord, what's going to, what's, how in the world are we going to make it tomorrow? I can go to sleep. I can rest well because I know tomorrow He's going to resupply that strength, that grace that I need for the challenges that I'll face tomorrow. And Tuesday, the same thing. And over and over again, every single day, God will be faithful to meet the challenges, to give you strength for whatever you have to do on that particular day. God wants us to fall so in love with him that we are absolutely dependent on him and when we're dependent on him, we remove worry. Anxious thoughts have to go. Lord, you're going to take care of this. I know you are. You're my father. You're the one that cares about me more than anyone here on this earth. I can trust you, Lord, that you'll be there for the needs of tomorrow and the next day and throughout the week and the month and the years to come. Whatever happens in this world, whatever happens in our nation. God's going to be there. He's going to be there to take care of us every step of the way. David, when he gets old, thinks back on his life, and he looks back and he says, you know what, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. God, you've been faithful. You took care of every single bit of that. The times that I worried, they were just a waste of time. I should have trusted you all the way through. Amen.